So welcome everybody. My name is Julia. I am the Community-Based Research Assistant in Career Space at Trent University. Thank you all for attending our first uh, grad, uh, virtual graduate and professional expo. So Career Space provides an authentic outlook on the career landscape by providing Trent students and alumni with meaningful experiences, necessary perspectives, and valuable resources. We offer virtual appointments, workshops, online resources, and opportunities to connect with employers and recruiters. These services are free for all Trent students and alumni. You can visit our website, trentu.ca slash careerspace to book an appointment or learn more about our services. We are thrilled to have representatives from Trent University Master of Science in Forensic Science today. Uh, before we go ahead and get started, I do have just a couple of housekeeping items to mention. So I will ask our presenters to please go ahead now and just place your contact information in the chat box so that everybody uh, who's attending has um, a way to contact you. Uh, we should have 10 to 15 minutes for questions and discussion following uh, the presentation today. Please feel free to ask your questions at any time using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. And as well, today's presentation will be posted to our CareerSpace YouTube channel. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests from Trent Uni University's Master of Forensic Science, uh, Master of Science in Forensic Science, sorry, uh, and ask that you please introduce yourselves and the floor is yours. Uh, so I'm Karen McQuaid-Smith and I am the placement coordinator for the Master of Science in Forensic Science program. And uh, my name is Barry Seville, and I am the uh, current director of the Master of Science and Forensic Science program at Trent University. And I'm very happy that you could join us. So one of the things that I would like to do is provide a very brief overview of the program uh, to uh, give you an idea of what we are, are doing this year for um, courses and for um, acceptance. So I'm going to share my screen. So um, I wanted to point out that the way that we have the course set up or the program set up right now is that there are core courses and elective courses. Uh, now on the website you will note that it indicates that this is subject to change. We're always talking to our students, we're always assessing what uh, needs to be moved, uh, needs to be brought out at this advanced level of forensic science. And so sometimes we tweak, tweak our courses and make different offerings. But for now, the core courses are communication science and forensic reporting, advanced forensic DNA typing, or advanced chemistry or forensic chemical analysis, Research design and statistics in forensic science, presentation of expert evidence and the courts, complex crime scene analysis, advanced forensic toxicology, leadership in forensic science, and advanced topics in forensic science. Now, the ability to choose between um, chemistry and uh, molecular biology is based on uh, students that we've had. You can, if you decided to take um, the advanced forensic DNA typing in the in the fall and you wanted to take the forensic chemical analysis in the winter, you could do that. It would be in place of doing an elective. The electives that we have are forensic psychology, biocrime and bioterrorism, basic bloodstain pattern analysis, firearms and ballistics, bioinformatics, and chemical sensors and biosensors in forensic science. So those are the courses, okay? And if you want to get into the program this year, um, this is the application procedure. This will be posted on our website, um, but I wanted to put it in writing so you had a, a better view of it than me just speaking it. So this year, it's a three-step application process. You apply to our program for, through OUAC. You submit the required documents by the deadline date, which is at the bottom of this slide. Then the Master of Science Forensic Science Intake Committee, um, a committee that consists of Karen and I and, and two other uh, faculty, they will review the applications and we will invite students for an interview. Only selected applicants will be invited for an interview and this will be via video conferencing. The interview does not guarantee admission, but we will use it as in a committee to allow us to 
select among candidates uh, for the ones most suitable for the Master of Science and Forensic Science program. So because we're adding an interview this year, our deadline for uh, applications has gone up. So for early acceptance, you need to have your application submitted by December 15th. And this will allow us to screen to set up interviews during reading week, um, February 16th to February 19th in 2021. Then there'll be a second group, which the application deadline will be February 1st and interviews for that group would be April 12th to April 16th. Now, let me tell you, there are 24 places that, you, that can be accepted. If we get 24 early acceptance, there will be no regular acceptance round. So that's what you need to be aware of. And now I did um, present some of this information um, at a meeting a couple of nights ago. And I noticed there was a lot of questions then about um, the placement. And so if you want to uh, maybe start with a brief overview, Karen, and then we can field some questions. Sure. So um, the placement component of the course, so in general, the structure is you do two semesters at Trent taking these classes that Barry was just talking about. And then your third semester over the summer is your placement. And the placement can happen at Trent, but it doesn't have to. Um, the placement process, however, starts um, basically as soon as you start the program. Um, one of the, it's kind of a course, it's kind of a prep thing, um, but it's, it, is, it is technically a course. It's Forensics 5090 that runs in the fall semester that everybody has to take. And in order to be able to do a placement, you have to take this course. And it covers things like um, writing resumes, practicing doing interviews, um, doing some market research on the field of forensic science that you want to go into. Um, and through that process, um, you also get to write something called a placement interest report where uh, it's a document where you tell me what it is that you want to do. And the way the placement process works is we will sit down um, currently over Zoom because I'm working from my house. Uh, but depending on the situation, it may or may not be an in-person meeting, but we will have a conversation about what your placement goals are. And then from there, uh, figure out where you're going to do your placement. And ultimately every year, there are a few new things that come up. Um, but in the past, we've had students do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, so I can, I'll talk about some of our previous placements that have worked out really well, but keep in mind that you're not tied to any of these things. Forensics is a really huge field and I'm always happy to make new contacts and try out different things. Um, but every year there's you know, an interest in say policing is a popular one. So we have contacts with a number of police agencies, including the RCMP, uh, the Ontario Provincial Police, um, some of the larger services in, in Ontario, like Toronto Police, York Regional, um, Peel, Halton, Hamilton, Guelph, uh, lots, of, lots of options there. And so students will go and do some kind of research project on site with that organization. So um, in this, the class that started in September of 2019, there are two students that are working um, in OPP headquarters in Aurelia, looking at some different fingerprinting techniques. So they are on site in a lab in Aurelia where they have access to actual fingerprint examiners that are currently employed by the OPP that do this to teach them how to do fingerprint identification. And if they're, you know, when they're running an experiment and they need these prints identified to be able to do comparisons. They have access to those experts that can do that comparison. And then the student takes the data and does the analysis. Um, we've had students work with new technology. So a couple of years ago with Toronto Police, there was a student who tested a new Sol gel fingerprinting technique. And um, she's 
currently in the process of writing up her project for publication. Um, she demonstrated through her research project that this new sol gel works really well. So the company that makes the sol gel is uh, quite excited for her to get her paper published so they can then distribute it as part of their sales pitch to say, look, we had this, you know, this independent research was done and it, they found out that this worked really well. Um, we just found out this morning, actually, that one of our other students who worked with the OPP two years ago, um, looking at the effect of dry cleaning on blood stain pattern analysis, she was just accepted for publication. So that should be coming out in the Journal of Forensic Science in uh, the new year. Um, and if policing is not your thing, uh, we also have a lot of lab options available. Um, most of the professors at Trent um, have taken students on occasion. Uh, Barry has one right now. Um, but uh, so there's, there's research projects available at the university, um, also with different organizations. Um, the program is registered officially with the federal government as a co-op slash internship program. So any of the federal co-op positions that are research-based can be your placement. So we have connections with, um, I mentioned RCMP before, uh, Canada Border Service Agency is a really big one. A lot of people don't realize they have some of the largest forensic labs in the country because everything that comes and goes across the border, whether it's being carried by people or sent through the mail has to be checked out. And uh, Canada Border Services has lab facilities in the Ottawa area, and they've taken um, a couple of students. Uh, we had one student um, two years ago who did her placement with uh, CBSA in Ottawa. And so she was hired on as a co-op student. She was paid for her summer placement term. Um, they gave her a couple of days off to come back to Trent and do her presentation, at which point they immediately hired her and she is still working there. So um that's another option she was doing some dna analysis work looking at um trying to set up cannabis genetics um, background information because of course it is now legal in canada so now it needs to be controlled and taxed appropriately um, and i just saw a question pop up here um if you're applying is there preference for completing a community-based research project versus an undergrad thesis. So for those of you that may not know at Trent, uh, in fourth year, um, we have something called the Trent Community Research Center where students can do a research project with a community organization. It can be anything in the community. It tends to be a lot of, um, if not profit, organizations are the ones that are more forensic in nature. Um, in terms of preference on an application, I would say no, it doesn't matter. Um, certainly research experience is a bonus, but it's not a requirement. This is a course-based master's. Um, we're looking for an interest in forensics in general, furthering your career, that kind of information. Barry, I don't know if you have anything you wanna add on that. Um, yeah, there, there's no... Uh no need to to uh, to focus on a, a community-based project. Um, quite frankly, the other panel members, with myself included, are more familiar with the thesis um, students, so we're good with that. So we rely on Karen and her experience and expertise with the community-based group um, to uh, to give us those as well. But there's no uh, no preference for one or the other. We can open it now for further questions if people um, have them. Um, if, if not, um, we can also um, come up with questions of our own. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, and I will just remind everybody the Q&A box is the best way to get questions to us. I did see um, Emily, your question was in the chat and that's fine, um, but I will ask to keep them in the Q&A just because it's easier for us to manage them. Um, and yeah, so we have one question from Mike. Uh, what are you looking for in an ideal candidate? A 90 average, uh, five years experience in the lab, and two years experience in industry. No. Um, <laughs> that might be what Barry's looking we, for. We, but. We've, we've, not, we've not had an ideal candidate. What we think is that we are looking for individuals who will move forward with us and learn with us 
to, to make an impact in forensic science in Canada or elsewhere. Um, and so what we, um, we look for diversity in background actually, which is quite interesting. Um, we really like our students to have a strong science background, um, but we're open to diverse science backgrounds. Um, what we do require is that you're driven, that you realize that this is a graduate program. So when Karen makes a statement that, you know, we're gonna have a, a, a brief conversation about what you're interested in doing for a placement, Karen doesn't wanna hear that you don't know what you're talking about, right? Karen doesn't wanna know that you haven't looked into the fact that certain police services don't do DNA, DNA analysis. The DNA analysis only happens in certain locations in Ontario. If you don't know that and you want to do that, it's best to find that out before you come. But the question was what we were looking for in a deal candidate. And we're going to have an interview process this year. And that interview process, we'll be looking for um, enthusiasm and commitment to learning about forensic science. So if you want to tailor your question, ask a little bit more on certain, I can, I can deal with that as well. Thank you. Uh, does the number of accepted students change per year? No, we're no. maxed out at 24 because that's how many fit in a lab section. So that's, it could be less than 24, but no more than that. Um, someone asks, Karen, do you have any ties to getting a student a placement at CFS? <laughs> so, it would be yes or no. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a loaded question. So, the Center of Forensic Science is one of the largest um, lab facilities. Sorry, can you guys hear bells in the background? I'll, I'll go to another one in the meantime, and then we can get back to that one. Lenny asks, I was just curious if you could speak to financial assistance or funding support. Sorry if I missed it earlier in your presentation. Um, financial assistance or funding. Um, there, I'm not even sure that we can get OGS. Karen, did we ever, uh, we can get OGS? So there is the possibility that you could apply for an Ontario Graduate Scholarship and use that fund to, uh, to come to Trent University for the, um, the Master of Science of Forensic Science. There are no scholarships at Trent specifically for the Master of Science of Forensic Science. Um, some of our students um, do TA in, um, in the Forensic Science program. They're not guaranteed that like a research graduate student is, um, but they can apply to positions that come available. And that will help as well. Uh, so it's financial assistance, Karen. Is there anything you could add? Um, well, we do have the one entrance scholarship. Oh, well, that's true. Uh, within the program, um, but it one or two. Yeah. There, so we there's a set amount of money that can either all go to one student or chunks to two students. And I honestly can't remember the value of it right now. Somewhere um, it's around fourteen hundred dollars each, so up to three thousand. But okay. So so it's not, it's not a lot, but it's basically, it's, well, it's, it's $1,500. So it's yeah. <laughs> nothing to sneeze at either. Yeah, but I mean, that is sort of awarded once we have our list of candidates, we look at, okay, who are the, the top candidates from this list? And that's who the scholarship is offered to. It's not, it's not a scholarship in the sense of um, financial need in any way. It's, it's based on a merit thing. So CFS. Yeah, so CFS. <laughs> Apologize, I have a puppy. It's nuts. Um, the Center of Forensic Science is uh, a lab. They have facilities in Toronto and also in Sault Ste. Marie. And they do a lot of the DNA testing that Barry was mentioning before that is not done in police departments. Um, and they have a program in place where they any member of CFS working as a technician or scientist or whatever can post a project that they want done. And then an outside agency, like say Dr. Seville from Trent University could say, oh, that project is in line with my research ideas. So I will reach out to, you know, Nikki who has posted this project and then set up to, to do that project for CFS, but at my lab at Trent. And then 
so a student can do work for the Center of Forensic Science, but they don't want students on site in their lab facilities. They used to take them on site, but the, the amount of processing required to have additional bodies on site is just too much. They don't have staffing available to supervise students because they don't have any non-case sample work that's happening. The, the technicians are so busy doing the casework that they don't do other work on top of that, so they don't have any capacity to have students getting a hands-on experience. Any kind of placement that you would do at CFS would be terribly boring because you would have to stand in the corner with your hands in your pockets and not touch anything. Um, whereas if you're doing work for CFS in Barry's lab uh, or any lab facility, you get that sort of ownership. You're running your own samples. You're doing exactly the same kind of work that you would be doing as a forensic lab tech at CFS, but you're utilizing samples that are not part of an ongoing um, investigation. So you're allowed to touch them as a student and, and learn the techniques and develop all those troubleshooting skills and all the different things that you need to be able to be a good technician. Um, I, would add, I would add to that, Karen, that in terms of this individual's interest in the Center of Forensic Science, that we have, well, for this year, for example, we have two uh, scientists from the Center of Forensic Science coming and giving talks in our, in our courses. And so you would have the contact there. We also have several graduates from Trent University that are now um, employed by the Center of Forensic Science. So there would be contacts there. Um, Definitely. Or skills are the, are, are the ones that are going to get there. I think we wanna move on to the questions. Um, and I was looking at them and if you don't mind, there's a couple I'd like to answer. Is that all right? Absolutely. I will say I've got about five more minutes and I do have to cut us short just because I've got another one after this. But um, yeah. Go, okay. Go so um, basic admission requirements. We're looking for an 80 average generally. I know that, that it, it says 77 um, and uh, you could be accepted with 77. Um, but we're looking for an 80 average generally, uh, an 80 or above. So the question then becomes, do we accept more trend students than non-trend students? Um, no, we do not. Um, the average is a key, right? Um, one of the things about uh, a student with forensic science background is that they would be able to get direct entry Whereas a student without forensic science background would be accepted, um, asked to take a course and pass a course, giving them some overview of forensic science. The interview panel will be three or four individuals, um, professors. Um, yes, the faculty are very accessible. So um, the faculty teaching in the program include myself and other researchers, Aaron Schaefer, uh, another DNA expert, uh, Mike Donaldson, a PhD in, in uh, molecular analysis. Um, Rhonda, who is our, our lawyer. Um, we also have former police officers who run uh, various courses and they are all quite accessible. Um, it's different now with, with COVID where, where that accessibility is, a, is an organized Zoom, but otherwise we'd be on campus. And did I miss something there? Oh, the courses that are similar to undergrad. One of the things that um, you have to realize about graduate studies is that it's much more self-directed. So we're taking all the courses that you see that have names similar to the undergrads and we're elevating the expectations and we're elevating the amount of material that we cover. Advanced crime scene anal analysis, for example, is at that advanced. The DNA analysis and the chemistry analysis will be much more advanced, but courses like biocrime and bioterrorism, they're gonna be pretty similar. So it, the, the electives are gonna be pretty similar. The core courses are going to be quite different and advanced. Blew through those pretty quickly. I hope that helps people, but we, we, are, we are limited in our time and I do wanna make sure that we get those answered. Oh, last 10 courses. 80% average from your last 10 courses. 
Thank you so much for doing those like quick fire style, Barry. I really appreciate it. Um, I do apologize that um, I, there were so many fantastic questions. Um, again, I believe the contact information for both Barry and Karen is in, oh, it only went to all panelists. So I'm gonna paste that right now while I wrap up for all attendees so that everyone has both Barry and Karen's emails and please do feel free to um, uh, continue communicating and asking all your questions outside of this. Um, oh, I see one more question. Last 10 full or half credits? I half. Half? Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, half credits. Uh, on that note, I'm really sorry. I'm going to speed through my, my little outro because I've got to get on to another webinar. Um, but thank you so much, Barry, and, and please do tell Karen thank you as well. Um, and, and to our students in attendance today, thank you as well for taking the time to learn about the opportunities with the Trent University Master of Science and Forensic Science. There are two upcoming events. One is our Trent Specific Graduate and Professional School Expo, which is November 13th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. You can register at trentu.ca slash SEP and click on the November 13th, hold the date. And as well, Career Space with Academic Skills is doing a virtual personal statement workshop on Tuesday, November 10th from one to two. That's gonna be in the student experience portal under the events calendar. And that is super helpful for those of you who are applying to grad school. Many, many programs require um, that personal statement or letter of intent, and this will help you to do your best application possible. And on that note, Thank you so much again, Barry, uh, for, for your wonderful, wonderful presentation. Sorry, tongue tied. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming and have a wonderful weekend. Check the website. The information on the applications will be up on the website um, later today um, or possibly tomorrow um, because we just revamped it. And um, yes, my email is also uh, on our, our undergraduate website as well. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody. Bye.